start. And I don't know if you wanted to turn your video on. Hi, Andy. I tried. Um, what happened when you tried? It said that I think it's a setting that you've placed that doesn't allow me to. Oh. Because you that? cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, I don't, <laughs> you don't want that. Okay, let's see. Did that work? Hello. Hi, Andy. No. Hi, how you doing? Are you able to turn video on? Uh, let's try that button. No, it's giving me the same message. That is so interesting. Is it because you shared your screen, maybe? But you unshared it, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sharing anymore. So you should have the ability to start video. And it gives me the choice to ask you to start your video. So I've done that. And then okay. when you click video, it doesn't let you put your video on. Uh, no. So this is our first session using Zoom for these collaborative talks. So I'm going to take two seconds. Abigail, maybe you start and introduce yourself. And I'm going to go into the actual Zoom settings and see if I can change this. Okay. okay. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Abby Akande. I am an assistant professor at Penn State University, the Abington campus, and I teach in the bachelor's program in rehabilitation and human services. Um, and so I've got experience in teaching. I also have experience in advising. And so that's kind of the angle that I'm going to be approaching um, my piece of the panel today, just my experiences with advising students at the college level, but also at the high school level. So I'll talk through some experiences there and also give some suggestions in working with students and helping them to shape productive gap years. So I'm afraid to interrupt, but I came back. Is anybody still talking? No, I gave my quick intro. <laughs> okay, good. Andy, what about you now? While Andy's doing that, Abigail, try and start your video again. And then if that doesn't work, log out and log back in again, and it should work. Okay. Andy, you're on mute. Did you want to unmute and tell us about yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm a teacher in a large, well, I say large. It is large for the UK standards, large secondary school. We, um, I'm a sixth form tutor, so for us in the UK, we have a sixth form, which is our last two um, years of um, sort of high school. They are eight, 17 and 18 year olds. They're the pre-university students. Um, I've been a tutor of these guys for about three years. Um, so I see two year groups come through. So juniors and seniors, they come through. Um, I do the university references in the school, and I also do a fair amount of uh, careers guidance and university guidance. Now, I am a massive advocate of making sure that our students uh, pick university courses that are relevant for them, have some meaning, and uh, fits with their long-term plan. Now, most students come through uh, my classroom, and I say to them, so um, what you did going to study? And they say, oh, I'm going to go and study psychology. I went, why? I don't know. It's like, well, that's three years of your life and 50 grand that you're about to invest uh, for something you don't know why. So we have good chats. We talk about... Um, soul searching, a little bit of uh, 
uh, getting some life experience before making that big decision to go and invest both time and money into something that they're not really sure what they're doing. So that's a little bit about me. Okay, good. And unfortunately, Abigail came out and came back in again, and she's still not got video. And I do not know why that's going on. I've given the permissions. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're going to have to look at me most of the time. Okay, so but let's let's have the conversation. So, um, so Andy, uh, how many students? How many students in the UK do you think take a gap year? I'd say it's a small percentage, 1% um, maybe tops, 1%, 2% tops, nothing more than that. Um, but, it, but it's we, better known, are, known here, right? It's what, sorry? But it's, it's a known thing, right? Oh, yeah, it's definitely a known thing. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of, uh, a lot of kids, um, they see the Steps University as the next thing to do before they then think about... Um, before they think about going to university, they, they want to do everything. They want to get university done. They want to get out there. But what they don't realize is by the time they come out of university, certainly like myself, um, I'd got uh, a partner at that point. I'd got um, a job, a house, and trying to take a gap year then, trying to get some actual experiences then was uh, really, really difficult. I can't hear you, Steve. You're on mute. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, so it's interesting, right? Because when I, talk, when I talk to parents about gap years, they're often the ones who are really afraid that we'll get their child off track. And I want to say to them, what are they on track for? Meaning, yeah, uh, you, you're afraid that they're going to they're going to fall off the bandwagon in some way, or they're not going to do they're going to lose opportunity. But are they on track just to accumulate debt for things that they don't really know if they want to study? And is that actually smart or would it be smart to take a break and figure out, oh, here's what I really want to do. Uh, um, yeah, that, that time completely resonates with me entirely. We, um, you know, kids spend an awful lot of time doing what they think is the right thing without actually thinking about what the right thing to do is. And those two things are definitely different. Um, but the kids don't see it. The parents don't see it. They think, oh, no, 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 must go to education, must get fully through education before they then sit down and stop and think, what, are, what am I being educated for? I have to admit, it took me a minute to jump onto the gap year bandwagon. And it, the longer uh, I, the longer that I uh, persisted in my career as a professor and as an advisor, I started to understand the benefit of it. But back then, my mindset was, if you take a gap, year, you won't come back, keep going, get that degree. And it also comes from a, a very egocentric perspective of going to school and kind of knowing what I wanted to do, whereas a lot of students don't have that experience. So it's definitely something that even has to grow on me. It's so funny, right? Because we talk a lot about student agency, but I often will hear people use the phrase student agency who actually don't want to let students really be full agents. Right, maybe there's a little bit of a dilemma we have here, which is we want to allow kids to be independent, but maybe we don't really. <laughs> Neither of you are responding to that. So, okay, so what would be, um, what would be like the best example you've seen of someone taking a gap year? So for me, uh, we had a student a couple of years ago who, um, as part of our school, we run a, an expedition to Kenya, building classrooms for um, communities that, frankly, are in desperate need. Um, but we do that with, within school time. So actually, well, it's the summer holidays. So we go out for three weeks and they have that experience. Now, um, one of our students then went back. Um, she did, um, she finished her A-levels in psychology and things. She wanted to become a teacher. So she went back out with one of our expeditions uh, straight, after, straight after college. She um, spent a whole year out in Africa, then went back to university. She's done two years of her degree for teaching and then gone back to a tiny little school in Akuru um, and done six months in a school. That, it wasn't a school that we built, but it was a, a charity-based um, education trust that um, she's then been out and helped again. So for her, it's been life-changing. 
Well, I'm on the front end of this. Honestly, I haven't had much experience working with students who've elected to take uh, structured or productive gap years. It's mostly been by default because of financial reasons or something along those lines. And it really isn't common, at least at the universities that I've worked at or at the high school that I, I used to work at. So it's something that I'm trying to uh, encourage and trying to uh, engage in more conversations with people about and help them to be a little bit more open-minded about that concept because like I said it just isn't really common around where I am and I haven't seen much of it. Okay so Dave in the chat says that he advocates for a mandatory gap year like the Peace Corps. Does this exist anywhere? Well it certainly would exist in a country like Israel with mandatory service. Um, you know there are probably other examples uh, churches that uh, ask their young people to serve a mission um, you're welcome in the chat to put answers in as well. Uh, Dave says, in Panama, there's an organization called Give and Surf. They have a gap year program, an, ep an excellent option. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm going to sort of live with that tension that, uh, that mandatory sort of, again, still a little, a little bit takes away the agency. Um, and that in order to have the benefits of a gap year, you almost have to kind of allow the students to, to do it on their own. A question I like to ask people here, and I live in North Carolina, but I think it's pretty representative of the United States. I will ask people, what percentage of high school students graduate as competent adults? And I don't know how you just responded there, each of you in the room, but uh, there's often an involuntary laugh and then a, a kind of a squirming, well, maybe 5% or 10%. And I guess my thought would be, if we're not really graduating adults, are, are, shouldn't we be doing something? And, and does encouraging a gap year actually allow them to become adults a little bit more? Thoughts? No, that's a, that's a brilliant question. How, how many graduate as adults? Hmm, yeah. Um, I hadn't even thought about that. And that's just making me think. And that's a question I'm gonna to pose to my head teacher. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to say to him, how many of our students graduate as adults? And I, wow, that's mind blowing. That's all I'm going to say. That. I can't. Well, well, Andy, I'm going to, I'll, I'll take it a little bit further because I've developed this thinking a fair amount after this. And I've come to the conclusion that, that even though we talk about schools as places of learning, they're really uh, sort of intended to create conformity and to, and to train for the workplace where you would do work for other people. And so, Maybe there's this inherent um, a degree to which we don't actually tell the truth about what takes place in school. There's like an elephant in the room. And because of that, when you ask that question of what percentage of kids graduate as adults, we're not really actually maybe geared to help them become adults in truth. You know, and at least in the U.S.'s history, there was a time when students would graduate from high school and they were adults. <laughs> and I think we've evolved from that now and we kind of have to catch up with the times. Um, students are taking longer to grow up. And you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, but we're just changing as a nation, as a world. Um, you know, we're taking on responsibilities later in life. We're staying in school longer. We're getting married later. We're having children later. We're living at home longer. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are things we need to address. So I have a question in the chat and it's from Anonymous. What if I'm interested in taking a gap year, but I have scholarships that require me to go to school right away? So I can't say this for sure, but my dad was Dean of Admissions at Stanford and then Dean of Admissions at Princeton. So it, there may be some credibility to it, but I can remember that kids were able to get a deferral. So you would write the admissions office and you'd say, hey, I, you know, I'd like to take a year off. Can I, can I get back in? Uh, and I'm wondering if scholarships might allow for the same thing. An anonymous viewer, feel free to respond in the chat or in the q and if, if that's certainly not the case. And so then the question would be, what's the value of that scholarship? And, and if you actually looked at it and thought about your life in terms of your life plan, does, does it make sense to keep the scholarship and not go do the gap year or should you do the gap year? One thing that I find really interesting when I work with students is they almost never have a long-term plan. Meaning, so this is their education, it's for their benefit, it's their life. And so uh, have they ever actually sort of sat down and said, this year, next year, the year after, college, <laughs> so, you know, and, and you would say, okay, well, that would be sort of a, 
a thing I would want to help you do. If this is actually your education and you're trying to maximize the benefit of it, what are your long-term goals and then how are you going to accomplish those each year? And then what are the things you're going to do both inside and outside of school that would help you become the person you want to become? And I'm going to look at some questions here and uh, either of you are, um, Andy or Abigail are welcome to respond as well. Um, yeah, um, see, I, I keep thinking back to this adult business and I think certainly in the UK, our education system is far more geared towards um, exam qualifications. It's, it's definitely narrowed uh, far more um, in recent years than it has, um, than I guess previously. I mean, there's lots, much more scope for people to go to college and, and do vocational subjects and things like that. But I mean, that's not still, I mean, that's preparing you for work. Um, our exam system is preparing you for further education, really. Um, but it doesn't really prepare you for life. I mean, we have so many, so many students that come out of school in the UK that have studied for certain subjects, but have no idea how to, how to run a bank account. They have no idea how to cook dinner. They've, you know, and at what point do we teach them that? And we don't. We let them go to university and they kind of fend for themselves. So uh, that, that, that question about who graduates from college as an adult is just mind blowing, and I kind of feel like um, it's a it's a it's a huge elephant that needs addressing at some point. Um, on the flip side of that, I do spend a lot of time uh, in my school advocating digital citizenship. So it's not part of a curriculum. You know, there's no course credits, there's no uh, exam in it. But I spend a lot of time collaborating with schools around the world. Uh, so much so that um, I've become an international links coordinator. And we teach experiences and, and uh, challenging uh, stereotypes and mindsets based on uh, real life conversations with other students. So that's got a virtual experience, but it's still not getting out there in the real world, spending you know, a year between high school and, and university to actually um, experience things and grow up a little. So you're going in and out there, Andy, but we heard everything. The, are you on a cell phone? Or are you maybe walking around? It, it's, um, it's a little bit of static, and then it goes in and out. Don't know what your circumstance is. OK, Abigail, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, well, yeah, and I've also been kind of commenting in the chats as well. Somebody asked the question, oh, why do you think students are taking longer to grow up? Um, and I don't. I don't think it's inherently a bad thing. I think it can be, and I think sometimes it's not, but I think it depends on the, the individual. But, you know, we're no longer, you know, getting married at 16 and, you know, dying at 40. <laughs> so along those same lines, we are pushing kind of these developmental benchmarks um, as a result. And I think that also relates to when we feel we are ready to do the things that quote unquote adults do. Um, and I think that's, fine, but uh, at the same time, do we also have expectations of our young adults that are not necessarily fair or um, expectations that they can't necessarily meet because we aren't equipping them to meet them? And when I say we, I mean uh, not only us as educators and advisors, but I think we have to understand the role that parents and culture plays as well because an 18-year-old in one household is not gonna be the same as an 18 year old in another household. And so it takes a village and there are a lot of different systems that come into play. And so I think we're one piece of that, but not the whole pie. I'm gonna say something really challenging and then we'll go to these other really good questions. So I, I like to call the kind of consumer culture that we're in a dependency capitalism model. So it, it sort of, it, uh, the, the current model that we have kind of benefits from us being dependent or feeling like we need things in order to be happy. So I'm wondering if, and I, this is not a new idea for me, I, people have heard me say this before, but I feel as though it's possible that maybe we actually are okay with the outcome of students not being adults because we actually want them to buy the things that we try to sell them and we want them to follow when we tell them to follow. And, and maybe the independence that we say we want in students isn't what we actually really want. I'll let you mull that over. Jack says, how do you think the education system can be redesigned to help make sure that people graduate as adults? So Andy or Abigail, any ideas on that? 
you're going to have to start again from scratch. Most of the stuff, certainly I'm, I'm a math teacher, and certainly 90% of the stuff I teach right now is kind of irrelevant in the modern world. Um, and, I, and I quite happily stand up and advocate that because um, we, teach, we teach students um, theories about shapes and things that they'll never, ever use in real life. And I would much rather spend my time teaching students things that will matter. I appreciate we are becoming an ever uh, uh, computerized world and people will be required to program computers and things. But actually, most of what we ask the kids to remember for four and a half hours of um, timed exam is pretty irrelevant in the real world. So I wonder if there's a degree to which a gap year represents kind of a reclaiming of independence, right? So, so if the, 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 you just described that the school system sort of works on this model of um, things that aren't necessarily practical or valuable, and, and maybe at core it's doing what Plato described in the Republic, right? It's the noble lie. It's sort of sorting people into groups and then convincing them that they fall into the categories and they should stay in those categories. So could we look at the gap year as a chance for students to kind of reclaim their own destiny? Is that, am I really popping a bubble there? No, I, I mean, I think that's one of the, the goals, right? Um, but I also think it takes a, a certain personality. Um, I think it takes a lot of courage. I think it takes a lot of support. You know, not everybody's comfortable stepping outside of the box, especially at that age. And I can remember making tough decisions and, you know, the first time I did something that my parents didn't want me to do and actually involved traveling overseas and how terrifying that was. And, you know, not everybody has the guts or the support or the finances. Um, but I do think that it is one way that we can really help students to start to, um, to gain that independence and to find their identities and to really explore. Um, but yeah. So, Jack, the, my answer to the question would be, thanks, Abigail, Abby. Abigail? Abby. 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 So, <laughs> okay, so thanks, Jack, for the question, because my answer has been not to change the system, but to empower students. But, I mean, I think like, like any other large-scale institution, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry or the banking industry, uh, that in order to be a good user of the system, you have to feel strong and confident and independent. And so my answer is that we don't change the system, but we help students kind of take charge of their own education. Um, Madison says, this morning I was learning about how children, we can be put in any environment and adapt the culture as our own. Do you think our society plays a big role in the reason we are taking longer to grow up? Okay, well, my answer, Madison, would be for sure. That's just me personally. Um, and I think that the delaying of adolescence in adulthood, um, if there's a great book called Teen 2.0 by Robert Epstein at Harvard, and he talks about how in most cultures at age 11 or 12, that was the transition to adulthood. And I actually think that our culture delays adulthood because in large part, we don't really want independent thinking. And if you want to get historical about it, I think after the 1960s, you'll notice that there were a number of policy documents that came out sort of from the high level think tanks that basically said, we can't govern with this much independent thinking, we need to sort of reduce that independence. And, and I think that's, that's an accepted message uh, at that kind of high level policy making level that, uh, that the 60s were problematic. And it might be what we're seeing right now with the Yellow Vest movement or, or lots of movements in lots of countries right now where, you, where governments worry that the people will get upset. Um, Andy or Abigail, do you have an answer to that question? Is this, is this a cultural thing? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, it's a cultural thing. We, um, and I, and I uh, you know, the, the things that you, you know, we've got to both said, we are totally delaying our, uh, our young people to become um, adults making the decisions for themselves. Absolutely. Do they stay at home longer than they ever have done? Um, I mean, if you, if you go back to not a particularly long period of time, you know, most people would have been married in their 20s, having children before they were 30. Um, and, and nowadays you look at it and people are still living at home until their 30s. They haven't got a long term relationship until mid 30s, late, uh, late 30s. And then um, it's, it's several years later before, you know, marriage and children come along. 
Right. It's 100. It's definitely cultural. It's political. And that also makes me wonder if there's anybody else in the chat from a non-Western culture or just from a culture who does things differently in terms of um, education. And I know because I know that there are some systems that are a lot more uh, structured, for instance, and um, give students or I guess funnel students into specific fields or careers a lot earlier on in life and don't really give them that independence or that choice. And of course, there are pros and cons to that. Um, and also the idea of, you know, living at home until you're 30 has, a, a, you know, a lot of different reactions depending on which culture you're asking. You know, in some places that is actually very normal and expected if you're not married that you stay home. So, and then you're thinking about how immigration plays a role. And so if you're coming from a country with that mindset and you're bringing that mindset into a country that doesn't have that mindset and you're surrounded by people who think that's strange, but that's your personal uh, plan, you know, or, you know, so it's, I think it's, it's definitely cultural um, and complicated because of that. So yeah, Kristen I mean, said in the chat, oh, go ahead, Andy. Sorry, I was going to jump in because um, I was saying earlier that we, we won this expedition to Kenya about building classrooms and things. And I spent quite a lot of time out in Kenya quite a few times. Um, and women's education, I'm not being sexist for this, but women's education is, is probably our biggest um, mm -hmm. battleground out when we're out there in Kenya because um, so often are the young girls, um, you know, captured by men is probably the wrong phrase, but so quickly do they end up in a relationship, they end up with children, and then they end up being the mother in the house. And that can happen from any age, from like 11 upwards. Now, depending on how um, that relationship is developed and how uh, supporting uh, the man is depends on um, how that relationship pans out. But quite quick, quite early on, um, out in Kenya and certainly um, other African countries, um, people are expected to take on the roles of being mothers and, and, and parents and, and uh, homemakers much, much earlier on. With pride as well. Yeah, okay, so, so Kristen said, do you think some people do not want to grow up and have all the responsibilities that come with it? I would say that's true of just about everybody. <laughs> and I think, so in my own personal background, I went on an exchange program to Brazil when I was in high school for a year with a Brazilian family. And there were a lot of things that happened to me that I wouldn't have chosen, but that I would never have changed. Meaning there is a degree to which, you know, becoming an adult is, is sort of being uh, exposed to difficult things and then kind of reacting and learning and growing. So um, Andy and, and Abby, thoughts about uh, this dilemma between knowing that things will be hard and then sort of willingness to choose what would be hard? Oh boy. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? I, I totally agree with you. People are, will shy away from responsibility for as long as they actually have to. Um, my nephew is 22 years old. He lives with my, my, my parents. So he lives with his grandparents. Um, he lives, um, you know, he goes to work during the week. He gets paid on a Friday. By Sunday, he spent all of his wages and he has no responsibility. You know, he, he doesn't want it. He doesn't want to have a home that he has to pay for, bills that he has to pay for. He doesn't want to grow up and be an adult, despite him being 22 years old and legally an adult. Mm -hmm. isn't, taking yeah. the path of least ahead, isn't taking the path of least resistance human nature, <laughs> right? I mean, we, if people around us enable us and allow us to, it's, why not? You know, I think it takes, again, it takes a certain personality to say, no, that's not enough for me. And I aspire to do more, but. I'm thinking of our youngest daughter who, when she decided to take world AP history, and it was known to be the hardest class at the high school and known to, to be just a semester of struggle. So I actually started to cry. And I said, you know, this is really your decision. I mean, you know, the other kids who have taken the class will tell you that this is the best thing they've ever done but it's gonna push you really hard. And she decided to do it. And I think most of us want to, at heart, become bigger than we are, right? We don't wanna, choosing to not take responsibility is not an act of power, it's a surrender. And I look at, so Andy and Abby, I look at this large group of sort of millennial kids and I think the world doesn't make sense to them in part because we're not actually telling them the truth. Right, so you know, they don't see a future the way I saw a future at their age. 
they don't see an easy pathway. You know, in some ways, it's actually harder for them to make this choice to go through hard things because that's not the model of the world. There is no good model of, okay, you work hard and then, you know, good, better things are going to happen in your life and you're going to have a path forward. When I talk to a lot of these young kids, you know, they don't see a path forward. Yeah, I, 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 to be fair, I have to agree. The, um, a lot of kids, unless they're, unless they're really predispositioned to, and they have a plan of exactly what they want to do from an early age, they, you, um, they are absolutely right. As Abby said, they'll take the path of least resistance and they'll do whatever the minimum is. Now, I'm going to try and spin this back to where our conversation started about gap years and, and maybe not even a gap year, but like a, a semester at sea that I know um, there are various organizations that try and support or, you know, years where they go and get some experience. They take the path of, uh, not the path of least resistance and actually put themselves out. Um, and, I, and I kind of think we need to encourage this more. Um, I, outside, of, outside of teaching, I'm a scout leader and I try and push my own children through, I've not push them through scouting, they're, all, uh, they're all going through scouting as it is, uh, but I try and push the scouts that I look after within my scouting role um, to push themselves out of their comfort zone to try things different um, and, you know, go on expeditions and experiences that really do push them beyond that. Now, how we can try and push that to the masses that come through school um, and our education system so that actually I think, what am I going to do at university? Why is it relevant? And can I gain some experience, whether it's traveling, whether it's an experience within the industry that I think I want to be a part of? All of that has got to be factored in and delivered to the kids in a way that actually makes them think, you know what? You're right. It is a, it is a big commitment going to university. I need to be ready. I need to be ready as an adult. And I've, you know, and the 18 years or the 14 years that they spent going through um, the education system, am I ready for the big wide world? So Quinn asked the question in the chat. In today's economy, taking a gap year is not always an option. Scholarships are much more difficult to attain when a gap year is taken. As a student who is going to rely on scholarships, I feel unable to take a gap year. What are your thoughts on situations like these? So uh, either, neither of you may feel qualified to answer this question, but maybe let's give it a stab. Either of you, Andy, Abby? Well, I, uh, part of my global collaborations, uh, I came across a guy who, um, who sponsors kids to, to go on a semester at sea or um, part of these things. So I appreciate that your college system is, is different to our university system. Um, and we don't have any, we have very few grants in our, in our world and most of it relies on uh, some sort of student finance, whether it be a loan um, out on themselves or whether parents take out um, finance in order to fund that. Most of it actually in the norm in the UK now is student finance. It's, it is loans where they pay, for, uh, which the loans then pay for their education um, to the university, but also their living fees and things like that. So it is, it is, it is tough here too. Um, but um, there are, there are ways of getting grants and bursaries for taking the gap year and whether I'd be surprised if universities would hamper the scholarship because you're trying to get um, more of an experience. That, that I just don't know. Yeah, it may not be that they're trying to hamper it. It may just be that so few students do it. They don't have an easy way and they're not going to create an easy way for someone to go through that process. Abby, I talked over you, I think. That's okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say, all right, unfortunately I don't have, I don't think there's a quick fix or an easy answer to that. Um, oh, and I lost my train of thought, Never mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going if you, you can come back. Yeah. So Elijah says, um, oh, okay, Madison said, I know that personally my fear of a gap year is finding something else in life and not ever going back to school. When I know education is important. Do a lot of students never go back after deciding to take a gap year? My experience, Madison, has been no, they go back to school. And my other answer to that is th that that question doesn't sound like you actually trust yourself. And I sort of feel like, okay, if you actually feel like you're growing as a competent individual, 
that you will be able to make a smart decision and you don't need to worry that you're not going to make a smart decision because that's always going to be you, right? It's you making those choices. And if something came up where it really was better than school and you made that choice, you might choose that. I, I don't think that's going to be the case for most students. I think they'll end up going back to school, but I think they'll end up going back to school and studying something different than they thought they were going to. Andy or Abby? Uh, I totally agree with you, Steve. So, sorry, Abby, you go, you go. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think the root of this issue is what I'm seeing with a lot of young students is a lack of purpose and passion. And if you're taking a gap year, there's supposed to be a purpose for that. There's something you're wanting to learn or do. There's some group of people you want to serve. There's some competency that you want to obtain or some skill. And the same thing with college. It's supposed to be a purpose or a passion behind it. Unfortunately, we're not helping our students to identify what that is. And, you know, that takes a lot of reflection. That takes a lot of guidance and support to do the work. And, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up and why? And what are my options? And, you know, I think the most common example is students having a desire to want to work in the medical field and they think doctor, nurse, because that's all they know. And that's our fault. We haven't, ex we haven't exposed our children to what their options are. And so they spend, you know, four years, you know, going through three or four majors. And I've, I have friends and students of mine who graduated with a degree that they don't use. And so I say all that to say, if you know what your passion is and you know what your purpose is, you're excited about your gap year, but then you're also excited to go back to school to be able to fulfill those dreams. It seems Abby, to me, I, I, go ahead, sorry, Andy. Steve. I was gonna say, I totally agree with you. Um, if, you're, if you take a gap year and you find something else that um, you're more passionate about than your original choices for, for college, university, how is that a wrong thing? That's the, absolutely the right thing to be doing. The last thing you wanna do is to come out of a university after four years and however much uh, it's cost you um, and then spend 50 years thinking uh, I'm you know I'm predestined in this role in this career that I've now taken but I don't love it and there's always something else that's been sitting in the back of your mind or even if it hasn't even come to mind it's just something you've, you've thought oh well I'm okay at this so I'm going to carry on with it rather than chasing something you're passionate about. So I'm going to say another bold thing we'll see how far I can get right Thanks, Andy. The, the, one of the interesting things about the sort of the current adult generation is I don't think that we've done a good job of taking responsibility for both leaving a world of certain opportunities and also helping youth develop the mental skills and capacity to perpetuate sort of a good culture and, and freedoms. And, and so, you know, we've got, a, you know, trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars of debt. This is really irresponsible kind of adult thinking. So in the adult world, we've, we've sort of allowed this level of debt to accumulate. We've sort of pretend that it's not gonna matter. But we know, for those of us who are old enough, we know that there are cycles in history. There, there are ups and downs. There, you know, no, one's, no country's immune from a depression or a recession. Uh, as, as awful as it may be, there are actually very serious things that can happen in countries that, that turn totalitarian or where, where people get killed. Um, you know, arguably there are things that go on in the world today where, you know, uh, like the shocking statistic for me is the number of people who've died in Iraq since the United States invaded. And it's kind of Holocaust level numbers. And you say, okay, so we're not immune to, to really bad things happening. And if we as adults aren't helping you as youth understand how you develop intellectually and in, in, in capability, then we're not doing a good job. And part of that development is becoming independent, right? So part of it is saying, hey, in order for you to actually make good decisions and make good choices for this world that you're inheriting, I want you to be independent. And being independent means you have to go out and do things that are different than I would necessarily would do. And I have to give you this, the strength and courage to do so. I'm gonna read a next question and it's from Elijah. I'm 16 and I think the same thing. There is no path forward, even though I have an electrical apprenticeship and an end to the electrical world, but I feel like there is no path because the education system isn't wanting to help me these days. They're almost more worried about filling seats and not helping the students. So again, Elijah, I think there's truth to this, which is here in the United States, we've seen sort of massive cheating by school districts to, to, to make sure they were still getting funding and, and graduating students they shouldn't have graduated. I think that's the 
a generation that that is not taking responsibility for for leaving the world a place that's easy for you to navigate. And so in some ways I'm sorry, but I also think that it means it's really important for you to gain a sense of independence and to feel like you're making your own decisions. And maybe that goes back to Maddie a little, right? Which is, you know, you're not gonna make perfect decisions in your life, but you need to have confidence that you can make decisions. Okay, so I keep walking to the end of the plank. Andy and Abby, have I gone too far? I mean, I do worry that we're not helping kids be independent, right? That in some ways it's that, you know, it's, a, it's a lot easier to not help create those and the, the conditions for people to become independent decision makers. It's a lot easier to kind of create systems that they need to follow. Yeah. But why are we doing that? Why, so I think why? we're, we're, <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I was saying, yeah. So, why why are we doing this? Why are we, uh, in inverted commas, protecting our children from from the perils of independence? Why are we stopping them from making the mistakes? Why are we holding back the reins from letting them go out there and and try things? I don't know. Okay. So Jenna says, I have multiple friends who are in college and university who just go because they feel the pressure from their parents and teachers. They aren't even set on a career and they feel as though they will just figure it out along the way. So far that has ended in some of them dropping out or changing the field of study. Both result in losing significant amounts of money and time. Yeah, and I can tell you, I, I meet so many kids every day who have large student loans and are working as a server or in a, you know, in a kind of career that's not, that's not necessarily with an easy path forward. And they, and they just feel like there's no good end. Um, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So my, my, own, my own personal experience. So I didn't take a gap year when I was 18. I went straight into university. I went and studied some strange science called physics, which I didn't really know anything about. I wasn't particularly interested in, but thought it's, it was better than studying maths at the time. What a silly mistake that was. Um, so I dropped out. I dropped out after two years. It cost me you know, two years of my life and a reasonable amount of money. I entered work, um, had about four or five different careers but still hankered back to becoming a math teacher because that's what my passion was about. And I knew that from a young age, but kind of made really bad decisions because I thought it was the right thing by my parents or by the teachers that uh, taught me at school. Um, and then a few years ago, so I, you know, I, I became a teacher in my thirties. Um, I've been teaching nearly 10 years and I'd, I'd gone back to my old school and saw my, my own math teacher who was just retiring. And she said, uh, she said, uh, let me guess, you've now become a math teacher. And she knew, she knew, having not seen me for 20, nearly 20 years, that I was going to be a math teacher, um, even though I had done everything I could to scupper that along the way. Lovely. <laughs> That's a very funny story, Andy. Okay, so Taylor says, I have a friend that took a year off T took a year or so off and she has gone back to school and she feels that she will get more out of her school because she is one year older and more mature. Plus some people need to take a gap year so they can afford to go to college. I like that. And maybe like Andy's story, maybe you go back to your teachers from, from elementary and high school and ask them what they thought you were going to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I think for me, the word, it has to be passionate. Um, we, we, we say goodbye to a student last year. She's, uh, she's gone off to study economics or something. And I said, but are you really passionate about that? She goes, no, but I want to, be, I want to cook. I was like, so why, why are you going to do economics? You're going to hate it. She goes, yeah, but uh, I'm good at it. So I think I should. And I'll earn more money from it. So I'll wait to see what happens to her because, you know, we've spoken about she's passionate about cooking and about piano playing. And neither of those fit in the economic world. But let's see what happens. Oh, that's no. Go ahead, Abby. And I was just saying that's interesting. I'm curious too. But just going back to your previous question about, you know, about this issue of independence and are we actually fostering independence if we're forcing our ch children to go to college? I mean, isn't that forcing conformity? I mean, I think college is, uh, I went to, I go to a lot of conferences for K-12 for high school here in the U.S. And 
I went to a college conference last year and I was shocked at how much it felt like they were talking about students the same way that the high school teachers were talking about their students. I, when I went to college, you know, it was a different era, right? We didn't have cell phones, but you know, I called home once a month. You know, I made most of my own decisions. I had to, I was pretty, you know, I was required to be independent and I felt like I was making my own choices. I didn't always make great choices. And you know, there were some, some classes I wish I had taken that I didn't and the like, but I still was making choices. It doesn't feel that way to me related to college as much. I think it's still a place of independence, but I watch a lot of families where there's, there's still a sense that the child is not really independent. Yeah, I think the most important thing is that you actually wanted to be there though, right? So <laughs> there is definitely uh, systems that you have to, you know, work through and there's gen general education requirements and courses you have to take. And, you know, that's, a, I guess, another conversation for another day. But I think the crux of it is that you actually wanted to be a college student in the first place. Whereas my concern is students who are going because it's expected of them or they are in a course of study that because that's expected of them that they actually have no interest in or no desire to do. And it's a shame to see these students, you know, dropping out in med school or, you know, going to law school and not taking the bar. And it's like, wow, you know, how did we get to this point? And why are we, you know, still finding, why are stu students still finding themselves in these kinds of situations? Well, and there's another interesting thing that's happened here. And Andy, I don't know if it's true for you as well, but we've created financial incentives for companies to encourage kids to go to college and take loans who, for whom that's maybe not the best choice. And so it is interesting to think about the way in which sort of we make decisions as a culture and, and those of us who, who end up getting to talk about kind of education, are, are we pushing back on some ways in which the, the profit motive has created uh, really untenable situations for, for youth who, who sometimes don't even finish school and then have a huge amount of debt. Mm, that's kind of interesting. So um, in the UK, all the student finance for the university is controlled through uh, central government, basically. Um, so it's all, um, it's, it's done through the government. The government controls the loans. They hold back the interest um, or they hold back payments whilst you're still studying. And then once you've earned a certain amount of money, you then means tested on, on how much you pay. So it, it's not profiteering by uh, loan companies. Um, what we have seen, this is kind of a, a flip side of this, we have seen uh, a rise in degree-backed apprenticeships in the UK where large corporations are funding students to go through university, giving them work experience whilst they're there, um, funding the whole course, um, and then obviously at the end of the three, four years, or however long it's taken them to, to complete that degree, um, they've also gained four years worth of experience too. Um, People are less po still less popular. There's a massive stigmatism around uh, apprenticeships from old, where apprenticeships were for things like uh, builders, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and things. Whereas the degree back ones are for, you know, for business, they're for um, economics, accounting. Um, but in the meantime, they're actually getting paid um, by the company as well. I have no idea how the legal side fits with somebody who goes through one of these degree back apprenticeships, um, if they dropped out, and I, it'd be interesting to find that out. But there's no, so unlike the US, there isn't, I mean, you, can, you come out of university regardless um, with some, some student debt, but it is um, government backed rather than uh, private company backed. Yeah, it's a, you know, that question of what percentage of students graduate high school as competent adults, I'm always looking for good questions to ask, and I think you'd ask a student would be, at what age do you think it's it's appropriate or will be of benefit to you to start making your own decisions, right? Because a lot of what I think we're, Abby, you're sort of identifying and I'm seeing is, it's this sense that, well, I don't actually know, but people are telling me I should do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I... We're, we're in a really funny place right now. So some of my kids in my class that I, that I have a tutor group for uh, have turned 18. And uh, on the 12th of December, they will be going to the polling stations to vote for um, our prime minister, our general election. And they are making decisions because they, <laughs> because they have the right to do so. Whereas um, in, the, you know, in their home lives and in everything else, they're being completely protected and, 
uh, and nurtured by parents. So it'd be interesting. I, I have regular interesting conversations about um, um, the politics of our of our lovely country. Um, I know you guys have probably had a similar similar conversations in recent years too. But you know, we're talking about creating adults leaving school. Well, I've got kids still in school who are making decisions on on a on a countrywide scale. So I think we're going to close in five minutes, so people have a chance to go to the next sessions. Um, did there was a note in the chat from Dave? Are we familiar with the term? Ikigai, and I looked it up and I love it. And Dave, do you want to put a note in the chat? Or uh, I wonder if I can even give you a microphone. I don't think I can because I've obviously not done a good job in the rest here. But uh, I'll read the description and see how you feel about it. It is a Japanese concept that means a reason for being. The word ikigai is usually used to indicate the source of values in one's life. And so, Andy, you were talking about this girl and her passion was cooking and she was going to do the, the financial career. At least in my life, for those who are students who are listening, I found that sometimes the passion comes because there's something I'm just deeply interested in, maybe something that was related to my family or a community I lived in. I, so I grew up around children on the autism spectrum, so I'm really interested in that. But oftentimes for me in my life, the passion comes from being good at something. Right, so I become competent in an area, and then that means that I can actually do something of value, and I become passionate about it because I know that I'm actually doing something valuable. So Andy and Abby, agree, disagree? How, how would you describe how passion occurs in your life? I agree um, I, that uh, having a talent or a skill can definitely be the root of passion, but I also think, too, just having an opportunity. Um, when you have an opportunity, when you're given an opportunity and you come from a place where you didn't have that opportunity before and you know what it feels like to not have that chance and you make the most of that opportunity, I think that can drive people to do amazing things. And when I say that, I'm speaking specifically about immigrants. I, my parents are immigrants. They came to this country for the American dream. You know, they came from a developing country where education wasn't free and they wanted that for their kids. And all of the people they came with made the most of that opportunity and didn't take it for granted. Um, and I think sometimes we take things for granted because it's there and we can take it or leave it whenever we feel like it. So sometimes I think passion is just because of a lack, passion can be cultivated. Wow, that was brilliant. Um, I have to agree. Um, it does come from um, an inherent interest whether it's a skill that you have from, from early childhood, whether it's something that you pick up naturally and you're really great at. Um, I've been skiing once in my life. I'm absolutely passionate about it. I'm absolutely useless ab um, at it, but I love it, which is kind of a weird sort of um, paradox to the whole idea of being good at something. So you want to, you want to, you want to do more of it. Um, but there just has to be that emotive connection, doesn't there? It has to be something that comes, whether it's, um, whether it is something that you just inherently good at that you just pick up and think, yeah, I can do this, therefore I can, uh, you know, I can go with it, or whether it's just something that just um, it just sparks. It's, it's, I guess it's a bit like love. You know, you see some something, someone, and you think, wow, and it's just that response to whether it's something in your life, whether it's something you do, uh, or something you want to do. I had grandparents, great grandparents, who were tenant farmers in Ireland, and their life was hard. I mean, I've gone to visit where they lived and, you know, I'm sure there was happiness, but it, but there was hardship. And so part of it too, if, you know, if again, if we're speaking to students is sometimes you just have to do hard things. Sometimes there are things in life that come at you that you, you didn't want and you don't, you know, it's not, not what you would have chosen, but that's kind of what happens in life and you figure it out and then you build the best you can from where you are. Uh, I, I, I think this has been a brilliant conversation, Andy and Abby. I'm so glad you were on. One minute for final thoughts. Life's about experiences. It's not about possessions. Go and experience things. Go and enjoy it. Take the opportunity whilst you can because um, life will get messy at some point and trying to get those experiences will become difficult later. And for me, um, don't be afraid to think outside of the box. There's more than one path to success, quote unquote, 
and it doesn't mean high school to college to career. And it's going to be different for everybody. And that's okay. Don't be afraid to explore that. Okay. I'm so glad the two of you came on this session. Thanks for those of you who've been participating and, and listening. Feel yeah. free to, uh, I'm going to put my email address in here. If Ab Andy and Abby are willing to, they can put contact information. But we'll look forward to hearing more from you. We've got two more of these sessions today on gap years. Uh, lots of different experiences. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone.